The techniques have been proven. The road building equipment needed is readily available. And with the increasing knowledge of soil cement testing procedures, a hard, durable roadway is assured. Soil cement is a tightly compacted mixture of a soil material, Portland cement, and water, which hydrates into a hard, durable structural material. But as with any structure, the material is subject to stresses from moisture changes and temperature changes. These cycles are repeated through the seasons and through the years. These cyclic changes create internal expansion and contraction forces that cannot be simulated by external compression and tension tests. Properly formulated soil cement resists these forces and retains its stability over a long period of time. Perhaps the single thing most responsible for the outstanding performance of soil cement has been the development of standard laboratory controls for soil cement mixtures. In the early 30s, the Portland Cement Association began research and development for the scientific control of soil cement construction methods. The test methods which resulted from this research were adopted as standards by the American Society for Testing and Materials in 1944 and by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials in 1945. They were revised in 1957 and reapproved in 1976. These tests, together with other valuable information gained over the years, are contained in the Portland Cement Association Laboratory Handbook. These soil cement tests establish the three control factors for construction. The adequate cement content for a strong, durable base, the amount of water that should be used, and the maximum density at which to compact the mixture. To determine these factors for a particular job, 75 to 100 pounds of representative sample soil is needed by the laboratory. The sample is prepared for testing by air drying, or oven drying at not more than 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Any old bituminous surfacing in the sample is pulverized to about the same degree as will be obtained in the field. The soil is then separated on the three-quarter inch and the number four sieves. All clods are broken up in such a way as to avoid reducing the natural size of the individual particles. The amount of material in each fraction is determined by weighing and referred to as the three-quarter inch, plus four, and minus four material. The material retained on the three-quarter inch sieve is not used in the test, but is replaced by an equal proportion of material retained on the number four sieve. The last step in soil preparation is to soak any material retained on the plus four sieve, which will be used later in a saturated surface dry condition. The minus four material is placed in an airtight container. The first test run is the moisture density test, which provides two of the control factors. This consists of compacting the soil cement mixture at several moisture contents to determine the moisture content that will give maximum density. An amount of soil sufficient for four or five moisture density trials is weighed. The batch may be reused for successive trials unless it is an unusually fragile material that breaks down under the rammer. Cement is added to the dry minus four fraction and thoroughly mixed. The amount of cement is based on an estimate of the cement requirement for the soil type being tested. The PCA laboratory handbook is helpful in making this estimate. For example, if the soil has an ashto classification of A2, 7% cement by weight would be used for the moisture density test. Later during testing, 5, 7, and 9% cement would be investigated in the freeze-thaw and wet-dry test. Sufficient water is then added to bring the mixture to within 4 to 6% of estimated optimum moisture content. If the soil contains plus 4 material, an amount of this material is added in proportion to the amount originally retained on the number four sieve. This material is added in a saturated surface dry condition obtained by soaking it overnight, then surface drying by light rubbing with a towel. 
A specimen of the moistened soil cement mixture is then molded by compacting in three equal layers. Each layer receives 25 blows from a five and a half pound rammer falling 12 inches. In the field, the sleeve rammer is usually used. While in the laboratory, automatic equipment is employed to save time and effort. In either case, the method of molding is the same. After the third layer has been compacted, the collar of the mold is removed and the surface of the specimen is leveled with a straight edge. Any surface irregularities are corrected by hand tamping fine material into the voids. The surface is again leveled with a straight edge. The mold containing the compacted mixture is then weighed. The known weight of the mold is subtracted to give the wet weight of the material. The specimen is then removed from the mold and sliced vertically through the center. A representative moisture sample is taken from the full height of one of the cut faces, weighed immediately, and dried in an oven at 230 degrees Fahrenheit overnight. The dried sample is weighed to determine the moisture content. This completes the first trial. The test is repeated at several moisture contents so that the moisture content giving the highest density can be determined. When the test is completed, the densities are plotted against the respective moisture contents to provide a moisture density curve. The moisture content giving the maximum density is referred to as the optimum moisture. The optimum moisture and maximum density are two of the control factors. The third control factor, cement content, is determined by freeze-thaw and wet-dry tests. Specimens at three cement contents are molded, for example, at five, seven, and nine percent cement. One set of specimens for the freeze-thaw test and another set for the wet-dry test. These specimens are molded at the optimum moisture and maximum density determined by the moisture density test. An important detail is the scarifying of the compacted first layer and then the second layer to assure adequate bond between layers. If the mixture contains plus four material, a knife blade is used to spade along the inside of the mold before compaction in order to obtain uniform distribution of the material. During molding, a representative sample is taken for moisture determination. Each specimen is weighed in the mold. This weight and the moisture content are used later in calculations to determine if the specimen is molded at the designed density and moisture content. Immediately after molding, the specimens are placed in a high humidity room for seven days, permitting the cement to hydrate and the specimens to harden before they're subjected to the freeze-thaw or wet-dry test. At the end of the seven-day hydration period, the freeze-thaw cycles are started on one set of specimens and wet-dry cycles on the other set. In the freeze-thaw test, the specimens are placed on water-saturated felt pads or other absorbent material. The assembly is placed in a refrigerator having a constant temperature of minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. After 24 hours, the specimens are removed and placed in the moist room or in covered containers to thaw for 23 hours. During this thawing period, the absorbent pads under the specimens contact free water in the thawing containers, which is absorbed by the specimens through capillary action. After the thawing period, the specimens are brushed to remove material that has been loosened by the stresses of freezing and thawing. The total area of the specimen is covered twice with firm strokes corresponding to about three pounds of force. The brush is of wire bristles, meeting specifications of ASTM and Ashto. After each brushing, the specimens are turned over end for end before they're replaced on the water-saturated pad. Occasionally, the laboratory technician should calibrate the firmness of stroke needed to obtain a three pound force. This may be done by clamping a specimen onto the edge of a platform scale 
and bringing the dial to zero. While applying vertical strokes to the specimen, the force needed by the operator to register three pounds on the dial is easily determined. After the 12th cycle, the specimens are placed in an oven at 230 degrees Fahrenheit until they are dried to constant weight. This takes approximately 48 hours. The wet-dry test is then conducted in a similar manner. After a seven-day hydration period, the second set of specimens are submerged in water for a five-hour period. For the drying portion of the test, specimens are placed in an oven at 160 degrees Fahrenheit for a 42-hour period. Again, the specimens are brushed after each cycle. Wetting, drying, and brushing is continued for 12 cycles, and weight losses are determined at the end of the wet-dry test. The minimum cement content for adequate hardness is determined from the weight losses of the specimens subjected to both the freeze-thaw and wet-dry tests. The maximum allowable soil cement loss depends on the type of soil. It may range from 14% for granular and sandy soils to 7% for clayey soils. These criteria are based on data from thousands of soils and the performance of the field projects represented. To illustrate how the cement requirement is determined, let us examine these three specimens. The cement contents are 5, 7, and 9% cement, and the corresponding weight losses are 20%, 8%, and 2%. Assuming this is an A24 soil, 14% weight loss is permitted. By plotting and interpolating the data, a weight loss of approximately 13% would be obtained at 6% cement. Since this satisfied the criteria, 6% cement by weight would be recommended for this soil. While the ASTM and Ashto tests just described determine the minimum cement content needed to produce a hard, durable base material, several weeks are required to develop this final data in the laboratory. However, an empirical shortcut test method has been developed for sandy or gravelly soils that reduces this overall testing time to one week. Only a gradation analysis, moisture density test, and seven-day compressive strengths are required. While this method does not always indicate the very minimum cement factor that can be used, it provides a safe cement factor, generally close to that indicated by standard tests. The gradation of the soil is determined by a sieve analysis. And if the soil contains appreciable clay, a hydrometer test should be included. In order to use the shortcut method, the soil must contain less than 45% plus number four material and 50% or more sand. Sand is material which is larger than 0.05 millimeters and settles out quickly. The soil must also contain less than 20% clay to qualify for the shortcut test. Clay size material is smaller than 0.005 millimeters and is still in suspension after one hour. After the gradation is determined, a moisture density test is run. In order to select the cement content for this test, it is necessary to make an estimate of the maximum density. For soils with no plus four material, the estimated density can be determined from this chart. This soil contains 23% coarse material between the number four and number 60 sieves, and 39% smaller than 0.05 millimeters. The chart shows a maximum density of approximately 118 pounds per cubic foot. Next, the cement content to use in the test can be obtained from this chart. Using 39% material smaller than 0.05 millimeters and an estimated maximum density of 118 pounds per cubic foot, 8% cement is indicated and used in the moisture density test. Let us then assume that a moisture density test has been completed and that the actual maximum density obtained was 119 pounds per cubic foot. Returning to the chart, the indicated cement factor for field construction based on the actual density of 119 pounds is still then 8%. This 8% cement factor 
is then verified by compressive strength tests on soaked and capped specimens. In this example, specimens are molded at 8% cement and broken in compression after seven days moist curing. The seven-day compressive strength value is then plotted on this chart. If the value falls above the curve, which it usually does, 8% cement is adequate for construction using the soil in this example. If the value falls below the curve, 8% is probably inadequate, and additional testing following the ASTM AASHTO procedures is needed to definitely establish the cement requirements. If the soil in our example had contained material retained on the number four sieve, the same procedure would have been used, but a different set of charts, also found in the PCA laboratory handbook, would be used. However, this shortcut test procedure does not apply to the dark gray or black surface sandy soils, cinders, chert, marl, or shale. These should be tested using the standard ASTM procedures. We have seen that to produce soil cement with satisfactory strength and durability, an adequate quantity of Portland cement must be incorporated with the pulverized soil. The proper amount of water must be mixed uniformly with the soil and cement. And the mixture must be compacted to proper density before cement hydration. These important steps can be controlled because control factors for construction may be determined by simple, standardized laboratory tests. Every day, more rapid and simplified test procedures are found as a result of research that is continuously being performed in laboratories of the state highway departments, universities, and the Portland Cement Association. As a result, the success of soil cement is truly test assured.